Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well done. <laughs> you know, okay, so first up, this morning, I was sitting at the dinner table. And I was like, why would I come and do worship? And I said this to Olivia. Because, man, I don't like doing this in front of you guys. I don't have any joy in that. Like, I love sitting at my piano at home, doing my own thing. I can sing off-key. I can play off-key. I can do whatever I want. And the best judge in the room is the Lord. And Justin asked me if I would play with him. I felt like I should say yes. But I don't really want to. Because you, you think of all the... Like, I'd really rather speak a sermon. I, I would do this 50, 100 times more than sing here. But when the Lord says you should do something, when you feel like God says go, then you go. That's right. And you're obedient. And the worst thing, you get rebuked and you get to grow. <laughs> Best thing is you get rebuked and you get to grow. Amen. <sighs> Today I want to talk about something that has been kind of following along um, as a theme. And it's partly of the books I've been reading, but also I, I, I picked up this book, uh, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I, I read it probably like a year ago, uh, or part of it. And then I recently picked it back up because the topic of grace has been something that I feel like you understand grace, but then you don't really understand grace. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that, but the word grace is actually <laughs> quite unique. I was looking up some definitions of grace, and the most known one is grace is our undeserved favor from God. Another de definition of it was God freely extending himself, reaching to people because he is disposed to bless them. God's desire is to bless us. That is not something we deserve. It's something that he desires to do. And then I found a, a, another one that I thought was really interesting. The spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favor in the salvation of sinners. And the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. God's grace is something that wants to renew us. Yes. It wants to sanctify us. It wants to, in His grace, we find this abundance. So there, there's two different grace types of grace you can apply to your life and, and I'm not saying there's not more but there's two that I, I remember out of the book that was quite that hit me quite hard and it's called cheap grace and costly grace. Has anybody heard this before? Yeah, yeah. There's cheap grace and there's costly grace. So but first of all, why do you need grace? Which one of you here needs grace? <laughs> All of you guys. Okay, so I see two hands up for Sylvia, so that means she needs double grace. <laughs> I haven't found scripture on double grace, but may the Lord just bless you with that. <laughs> grace. We all need it, but why? Why do you need grace? Because I'm a screw-up. <laughs> well, how could you be a screw-up if you're God's masterpiece? Yeah, right. Because you're, I don't you're receive, not a screw up. Because I don't receive the grace that's given to me. <laughs> there we go. Now we're starting to go in the right direction. So you got to think of this. God creates you, right? He knits you together in His mother's in your mother's womb, right? Right, right? So you are a masterpiece of God's design. So don't ever think you're rubbish because you're not. Otherwise, you call it what God has made rubbish, and I don't think that's accurate. Okay. Like, do you know how some people are like, I'm such a sinner, God could never do, but because of him. It is true, but you are not created as rubbish. Right. You're created as a masterpiece of what God has designed. So that's, and then we come into this world and we do all sorts of things. <laughs> and then we do something that's called sinning. Any of you have ever sinned before? 
Anybody who hasn't sinned in this room? Sinned? I'm sure. We'll, we'll talk later. I can show you a few things. <laughs> uh, we all have sinned, and that's why we need grace. We wouldn't need grace if we were perfect. Now, some of the definition of sin, and I looked into Strong's, and I thought that was really in interesting. It's missing the mark. Sin is like us missing the mark. What mark? The mark that we get told. Last week I talked about this beautiful book right here and how important it is to our lives. Missing the mark is following your book instead of this book. That's missing the mark. You know, when I come and I serve Darren because I love Darren, but I do it because I kind of want Darren to love me in, like in return, I can actually love on him out of selfish ambitions because I want something. Now, is that missing the mark? Yeah. It is. It's these little things that we have in our heart when we try to walk through life and we do things, we can have bad motives. We can have the bad reason for doing something. It could look really great. Here, everybody, uh, I'm going to put in a check for $10,000, okay? Like, don't thank me for it. Okay, like, it's anonymous. Okay. <laughs> Do whatever you want with it, but let it go to the children's ministry. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, and that's cool. Like, please give $10,000 to the children's ministry. Go for it. I bless you. I release you. But everything we do has a heart attached to it, right? Our motives. And we need to constantly check that. So once our motives are wrong, and I know you all as children have had wrong motives, because the one motive that every child has is pure selfishness. Have you ever just, well, am I wrong? <laughs> like, when kids are born, they only cry because they need something. They always want something. They're never like, oh, I'm crying because I want to meet with you and hang out. No, they're like, give me food, change my diaper. You know, carry me around. Oh, you put me down. How dare you? Okay. I will tell you for the next hour that that was the wrong choice, Mom. Okay. So if your kid ever says, like, oh, there's no sinful nature in me, just remind them that you raised them and that you know them and you know it's not true. So we start missing the mark pretty quickly in life. And I think that's good. I actually think it's good that we don't know the mark right off the hop. Because then we understand the need we have for salvation. We understand the need we have for God's grace. Because we, by default, are not going to make it. We will not hit the mark if we just come out of the womb running and do it our whole lives on our own and think that we're going to hit the mark. We will not. That's the whole point of grace. It's to help you and come. I'll show you where the mark is. I will bring you back into this. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. You know what's funny? I had a good laugh last week. Some of you did too. Charles definitely did. <laughs> I was talking about the Bible and how we need to read it in context. Meanwhile, I, I told you to read scriptures and I told you two verses that don't exist. <laughs> right? I don't know which one it was, but man, afterwards he was like, um, Robin, can you show me verse this and this? It's like, sure. Oh, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Fine. I was just seeing if Charles would pay attention, and he did. You passed my one test last week. <laughs> We're quoting scripture now. <laughs> Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> being justified freely by His through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation, 
about petition? Is that how you say it? By his blood, propitiation? Anyways, what you guys said. By his blood through faith. To demonstrate his righteousness because in this uh, forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Um, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and a justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it tells us that we've all fallen short, that we all need grace. Now, most of you are like here, like, okay, like, duh, that's why we're here. So can you carry on? Okay, I will. So we've all sinned, so that shows us that we all need grace. If any of you have a hiccup at this point, this is where you turn to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, forgive me. I do need your grace. I have missed the mark. And I want to return to you. Jesus dying for us, that cost of his death is to extend his grace. The cost of his life. And, you know, we get to read about that, and we get to hear about that, and we know we get God's grace, and we know we get God's forgiveness, and we know he died for us, and now we can live our lives in two ways. We can live it as in cheap grace or costly grace. Cheap grace is like this never-ending bank account of mistakes you can make because God's grace covered it all. For some, and if you look in our world, we're heading more and more in this direction, even within the church, where we just use this grace to continuously wipe away the things that we do wrong. And actually, let's bring some stuff in and let's just cover that under grace because God's grace is sufficient. And that is correct. His grace is sufficient. That is scripture. But there's more scripture talking about how important it is that we change our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That we become new. It is not just there to continuously be your magic eraser. It, like God's grace is cheap when it becomes your magic eraser as you walk through life. Oop, stumbled there. Oop, stumbled here. God, can you please forgive me? Can you please forgive me? But there's something that actually we forget. We ask for forgiveness, but actually the most important part of when we ask for forgiveness is repentance. We're starting to leave out the act of repentance. Repentance means I'm going to turn around and go the other direction. If I've kept going this way, and this way is leading not to life, but it's leading to then we need to turn around. Isn't that very straightforward? Yeah. Now, if we go along this road to death, and we just keep, you know, we, we feel this check, it's like, okay, God, forgive me, and we just keep going. We need repentance. This morning I read a scripture that tells you why we need to repent. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 to 16, and I promise you they all exist. Okay? First Corinthians 3, chapter 10 to verse 16. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So, Paul is talking to <coughs> Corinth, saying, hey, I've shared the gospel with you. And in the next verse it says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, Paul laid a solid foundation in Corinth of who Jesus Christ is. Your Lord, your Savior, His grace paid for your sin. You are called into an eternal life. You are a new creation. These are all the promises. You get baptized, the old dies, the new comes, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is how you are to run the race. That is your foundation. That is where you go off. So he's saying, that's been done. The foundation has been laid. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. The day is the judgment day. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. 
If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through, a fire, uh, as through fire. So you need to understand the first part in this is everything that we do on this earth will be tested at one time by fire. Why do we live on this earth? How do we live on this earth? Do we live under cheap grace where we kind of use God's grace to patch up all the mistakes that we make and we don't really repent or turn away from those ways, we just kind of use it as a never-ending unlimited bank account to cover up what we mess up in? Or do we live a life worthy of what we're building on top of that foundation that will stand? Now the interesting part is it says that they will still get into heaven. God's grace is amazing. I don't understand all of it. But I want to go into heaven with a reward. I don't want to go into heaven crawling out of a burning building. That is not my desire. I don't think any of you want to go into heaven through a burning building. Through fire. We, this morning was pretty amazing. We had a, in our pre-service prayer. And I, I want to encourage you. 9 o'clock, we come here together, we listen to some worship songs, we just sit and we listen to what God is saying. And then we pray together. That's a powerful time. It is. To be honest, I get so filled up before that. I could call it quits at 10 and you guys can do whatever. I've already got what I needed for that day. Okay? But because I love you, we stay. Okay? Uh, but it is so good. And this morning, um, Wayne, last week, I'm going to share a little bit of what I heard you say. Last week, Wayne came to me. Wayne, raise your hand. That's Wayne. Came to me and said, like, ah, I kind of feel like a word on my heart. But it's not like, you know, a, a nice word. It's more like a direct word. It's a bit of a rebuke. Um, he said, we, we have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Now, before you even, like, yes, uh, this morning, before I even shared that with anyone, Cindy already felt like, oh, man, we need to be in this world but not of this world. We need to rid ourselves of the things that are of this world. Right? If God's grace is costly to us, we will honor Him by not missing the mark, not living according to the customs of our world. You know, we can live based on the, the settings of our culture. You know, our culture has a huge impact on us. I notice this because Olivia and I are born in completely different parts of this world, and we have different cultures. So we get to do some wrestling with one another of what is God's culture. You know, she, she says this thing when she's like, hey, Robin, uh, your Germanness is hanging out. <laughs> that means my German culture is above my God culture. Do you understand that, that difference? Now, she says that in a funny way, and I don't always receive it super Ooh, that was a good joke. <laughs> But it's a good challenge. Where does our culture hang out? You know, like, Germans don't have a culture necessarily of getting offended easily. I've noticed living in Canada that offense is a little bit of an issue in this culture. Okay? Like, everything is offensive. Now, if you talk, have, like, my wife used to say this, when my mom and I would talk, she'd think we'd fight. Because it's just so direct, right? Like, we don't sugarcoat things. We just have a conversation. We have a good debate, and then we walk away from it, and we love each other, and there's no issue. Where if I would talk to Lydia that way, I'd be like, oh, that hurt my heart. You know? And then I get to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> and you all know what that looks like. I'm sorry, honey. Um, I'll speak more softly. But anyways, there was this interview with another guy, and, and this lady was asking some very specific questions. And she was like, well, with... You have a very strong opinion. So, with your strong opinion, you would potentially offend so many people. How do you feel okay about that? And he looks at her and he's like, your job is to offend me right now, is to prod me, is to poke at me to see what comes out. It's my choice if I'm offended or not. We live in this culture where we let ourselves get offended. You can't actually be offended unless you let yourself get offended. Like, let me put it this way. If Justin came up and said, Robin, you're an idiot. And I would say, thanks for your feedback. Have a good day, stay. <laughs> I have two choices with that. Number one, I can say, I am an idiot. Number two is I can say, what do I care about what Justin says? 
I can allow offense in, and then I can mold my life according to that. But the best way would be to say, hey, Justin, that wasn't really nice, but I don't think I am an idiot. Thank you very much. And you move on. But if you carry your offense afterwards, I go, I don't know, Justin, because you said that. Justin's never said this, okay? He's a nice guy. He wouldn't say that <laughs> to my face. Um, <laughs> I do some stupid things sometimes. I own that. Shot myself with a nail gun right in that hand, and he was right beside me. He's like, oh, pulled it out. Come on, we go. <laughs> It has happened. He was probably thinking like, good job, Robin, that was really smart. He was like, oh, let's pull out. <laughs> so culture has a huge impact on how we live our lives. And we actually need to peel back the layers of our culture. Because we can't hide behind our culture. Because we have to go towards God's culture. Into a new culture. His culture. It is amazing to see when we start peeling back how many little things are in our culture. And it, it comes out more when you have two different cultures at home. But now if you don't, you need to be extra careful. Because you could both be operating out of that. It's good to challenge that. Now, that could be one way we conform to this world. But there's other ways we can conform to this world. It's how we allow pressure of fitting into our society, allow and dictate how we live our lives. The fear of saying the word, I believe in Jesus, because you don't know how people are going to receive that, that can also be a big pressure. Why do people not really want to evangelize? Because, man, like I don't know how they're going to react when they bring up the word Jesus. And people react, and it's good. You guys have to understand, when people react to the name of Jesus, that's not because of you. It's because of that name. That's right. That's right. That name carries power and authority. And if people get upset at the name of Jesus, they're not upset at you who said it. It's because there's something there that they don't want to deal with. And there's an avoidance. And there's, a, there, there's so much that happens in that name. So, But then we have Romans 1.16 that says, Do not be ashamed of what? Gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Cannot be ashamed of it. Our culture needs to be, we need to be glorifying God and understanding that He is the one that gave us grace when we didn't deserve it. That's our culture. We need to live out of a gratitude and rejoicing and thanksgiving that we get to walk through this life knowing we're walking straight into eternity. That is such a gift. I heard the other day if you um, a math student looked at eternity. And if you want to do any division in math with an infinite number, the result is always zero. So, I'm 33 years old. Divided by eternity, it's zero. Some of you are 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old. Grace comes sometimes. She's, I think, 90? 91, 92? Divided by eternity is zero. The amount of time that we have while we're here is really compared to eternity. Like, it, I don't, you can't even describe it because actually technically it's zero if you divide it by eternity. So what we do in this kind of blip but a vapor makes all the difference of how you get to spend eternity. Isn't that crazy? So we sometimes feel like, oh man, life is so tough. It is tough. And it is hard, but it's only for a vapor. It's only for a short time. I can, most people that I talk to that are change their hair color naturally over time will tell you that life goes by fast. Very <laughs> wise. You know? And I think the older I am getting, and I look at my children, the more I realize time does go by really fast. It just goes by quick. So really, when we're worried about how is everything going to be, actually, that's why in, in, in Matthew it says, don't worry about your life. It'll go by super fast. You'll be okay if you put my kingdom first, because then you're starting to build with something that's worth building. But don't do it out of your own strength, your own motives, your own ambitions, but by understanding that the price has been paid, that by His grace, you get to build. 
Do you understand that? It is His grace that allows us to even build on that foundation because without His grace for us, there would be no foundation. He understood and desired us so much, He said, Son, you're going to die for them. And you're going to be salvation. And He is. When we call upon His name, and when we repent, and we turn from our ways, He brings salvation. We get to live for eternity with Him now. So, how do we treat that? I thought about this illustration, like if this tablet, if I was to give it to somebody, and you would take it, you might treat it nice for a little bit, and then you might stop treating it as nice, because that's kind of what we do when things are free. But when you have to earn every penny for it, when you have to save up for it, you savor it. You treat it like gold, like it's something precious. It's easy for us to start treating God's salvation and the gift of His grace cheaply because it just it's always there. It's always ready for me. You know, I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So a few more pages further. 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 to 12. So this is Paul, still talking to the church in Corinth. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. So pause there. By the grace of God, I am that I am. His grace changes who we are. We have a new creation, we're a new person. And His grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so he believed. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do you su um, do some among you say that there is no re resurrection of the dead? You know, God's grace enables us to carry out the calling that we have. God's grace is understanding that he has the power and the freedom to raise the dead. He will raise you up one day. One day, you will become. You don't have to go through death in the same way as others do. You'll be raised back to life. I was looking at Paul, and I think he's a great example. So I wrote some facts about Paul, because I thought, you know, if you look at someone like Paul who, who understood the costliness of God's grace, because he talks about himself. I was the one that was persecuting the church. I was the least of them because I have went after them. He had such a good understanding of God's forgiveness and what his grace meant. Look at how he lived his life afterwards. That is the power of grace. Now, Paul traveled approximately 16,000 kilometers by foot. That would be walking from here Oh, uh, not even from here. From the north tip of North America to the south tip of South America is 14,000 kilometers, to give you a reference. Wow. So that's shorter than what he walked. And he walked through mountains, through valleys, through wind and weather, by ship, by foot. Like Along the way, Paul planted 20, at least 20 churches that we know about. 20 churches. Now, those churches created more church plants. So technically, through the seed that he sowed, multiplication happened. But, read through Acts, and you will see Paul's fate in most places. Anybody know what Paul's fate is in most places? He gets kicked out. He gets rejected. He gets beaten. He gets stoned. Okay? So often we expect to kind of walk into, you know, let's say we're going to go do this amazing... Um, 
revival thing in Vancouver. We all marched there and we were all like, everybody loves us, everybody loves Jesus, it's a great revival. And then all of a sudden, opposition comes. And we think because opposition comes, oh, that we, we should just, uh, this is no good no more. But man, opposition comes every single time when you live out God's plan. It's just our soup kitchen in town, we will have opposition. Brace yourself for it. Have your faith rooted in Christ because it will come. It will come. It's not a question if, it's more when. But along the way, Paul planted all these churches. He brought life. Now he was rejected in those cities, but he left something in each city that grew. Churches that grew. Something that grew inside of that environment. Isn't that amazing? But his life didn't sound like a whole lot of fun. Which one of you would love to do what Apostle Paul did? Maybe spiritually speaking, I love to heal the people and let them touch my, you know, like walk in the shadow of me, walking and they get healed and all that kind of stuff. But he paid a price. He paid a hefty price. But it's because he understood the cost of grace. Because he understood that Jesus died for him now his entire life. He's dedicating back to Jesus. Our proper response to God's grace is to offer ourselves back. It's to say, Lord, now do with me what you would want to do. Because I understood. Like, man, if you go into eternity, you're not going to labor in vain anymore. You're not going to have tears of sadness anymore. Okay? So all that will be taken away. So whatever opposition, persecution will happen, will happen while you're here. That is the price we pay. But that's worth what we're walking into. It is not a whole lot of scripture that talks about how amazingly comfortable your life will be up here on this earth. Unless I'm not finding those, please share them with me. <laughs> but I just don't see it. But we want it. That's the struggle right there. Do you understand it? Yeah. It doesn't promise us in the Bible anything of comfort and how peaceful we'll ride on our days doesn't really talk about that a whole lot. You can still have peace inside, but it's not going to be from the outside. <laughs> it's more from the inside. Now, following God's plan for your life will have a cost. And we all have to be willing to say yes or no. When Jesus was talking about, I don't have a home. Like, foxes have holes, birds have nests. I have nowhere to lay my head. Paul can say the same thing. Can we say the same thing? Most of us have a home. So we have that comfort. Then there is material things. The comfort of having a car and a bank account that doesn't make us worry. Some of us do, some of us don't. We're all in different boats. But there's comforts in this world. But when Jesus was talking about the comforts of this world, when he was talking about that there's no home, he started talking about not looking back once you put your hand to the plow. He had multitudes around him. He sent out 70 afterwards. Do you understand the difference? You have 3,000 people that will listen to you all the time until you tell them what it's going to be like, what life is supposed to be like when you follow Jesus. And all of a sudden we go from over 3,000 people to like 70 that get sent out. Why is that? Because they counted the cost, and it was too much for them. Who are we? Are we part of the, hey, 2,930? Are we part of the 70 that will say, God, I'm going to give it all. I'm going to surrender it all to you. I will be the living sacrifice Paul talks about. And that could be like, I'll play worship this morning. I will go stand at the door and greet people. I will come in later and I will clean because that's what I feel God put on my heart. It doesn't mean that you have to have the most globally recognized ministry. It means that you have to have a heart of a servant. What is the last thing Jesus did at the supper before he went on the cross? Wash their feet. So we don't understand that because if I took my sock and my shoes off, my feet apart from potentially overgrown toenails, will be pretty okay, okay? 
You might find some of that lint stuff between them. Anyways, so there, it's not going to be that bad. But if you think about Jesus' time, did you understand that the, the person who washed the feet at a person's house was the lowliest of servants? He was not just a servant in the house. That was reserved for the lowliest of servants, usually a female lowliest servant. It was for the cultural bottom of the bottom. That is who washed the feet of the men that entered the house, because they walked through dust all day long, and their feet would have been disgusting. So Jesus came and said, I will wash your feet. What was Paul's response? Uh, sorry, not Paul, Peter's response. Don't you dare wash my feet. I, want, I need to wash your feet. And he says, well, if I don't do this for you, you will have no part of me. That was Jesus. Jesus lowered himself, not just to a serving role, the lowest serving role, as an example. He made that point right before he went on the cross. Why did he do that? Why was it important to leave on that note? Because that is what he's asking of us. We need to become the foot washers. Now we can culturally just wash each other's feet out of a traditional sense, or we can take the metaphor and we can take the teaching of us becoming the lowliest servant to serve one another, to serve our community, to not... The two commandments, I shared this last week, they're not about us. They're about how we love God and how we love others. We are called to serve one another wholeheartedly. That can be challenging because we like to have little hooks. But if we understand the cost of God's grace, we're willing to let that go. I'm on that journey. I can't say I'm perfect in this, but it's, it's this goal, it's this thing that is in front of me that I want to walk to. I want to be part of this heaven. I don't want to come up to heaven and be part of the 2,930 that heard. I think that is amazing, but I don't really want to walk it out. We always have that choice, the free will that we are given by God. We can be the 29-30, or we can be the 70. Now, don't quote me the 3,000, it's a rough estimate. But it symbolizes just how much more people will hear of God, who will accept hearing of God, but will not want to accept the transformation that it's supposed to have. Because it's difficult. So in the beginning, I started with grace, where most of you were like, I have a solid understanding of grace. At the end, my conclusion, my point I want to drive home is that if we really understand the cost of, the, of grace that we received, it needs to bear fruit in our life. It needs to bear fruit to a point where our life is in complete surrender to Him. That is the challenging aspect of grace. How do we respond to it? I received it. I want to receive it. Anybody who doesn't want to receive God's grace? No, we want to receive it. Let's live up to it, too. I'm not telling you do a whole bunch of works for God. I'm saying dive in. Pray. Ask. Seek. Knock. Be diligent. Make Him a priority. Get up. Seek Him. Seek the kingdom first. Make it a priority in your life that He is number one. It is hard, because you wake up, and you could wake up like right now, our kids are sick. So guess what we wake up to? Crying children. They have a nosebleed. They have this. They have that. Like, there's always something, and it's not like you wake up and it's like, okay, hold on, son. Stop your nosebleed yourself. I'm going to go pray. Right? But we do need to make time and priority to pray, to seek God. Not just on a Sunday morning. This is where we rejoice together, get filled up, where we encourage one another, where we poke one another a little bit to keep going. But man, life comes at home. That time with God. Make it a priority. If that's the first step, God, I understand the grace you have for me, so I'm going to come. I'm going to come to you day by day. Start right there. And then start by asking, God, what do you want me to do today? And then my, maybe along the way you'll miss the mark. I have many times, I've had moments where I feel like I need to talk to somebody or pray for somebody that I didn't take. 
You go and you do true repentance. You say, Lord, next time I'm going to go. Give me another opportunity. I am not done yet. I want to keep going with you. Have a hunger for his kingdom. He will reward you. Maybe not as much here as later on, but it's going to be worth it. So I wrote this little thing. God's grace is not a magic eraser for my sin. God's grace is what gave me life. Now I will give it back to him every day of my life. That is my desire out of the understanding of what grace is. Amen.